Hello. Um, something interesting happened this weekend that gave me an idea, or rather, my covers gave me an idea, which uh, is why this little video, and it's going to be a short video, which I hope to do it every week, came about. A little bit of background then. Uh, in 1508, if I remember correctly, um, there was the birth of somebody called Ramosha Alshech. Ramosha Alshech was one of the great Kabbalists of Sfas, Sfat and uh, one of my greatest uh, heroes, in fact, uh, my favourite commentator on the whole of the, on the whole of the Torah. I study him uh, every week and have done for ooh, since I was a teenager. So Ramosha Alshech um, is very much part of my Jewish DNA. So the reason that this little video has come about is because, interestingly, um, a while back, one of my students, one of my top medium here in America, he's a doctor, he's a wonderful fellow, Charles Fleischner, came and presented me with this. And this is the a copy of the Alshech's commentary on the Torah, with a piece of paper, the fellow, uh, which was printed in 1861. And it's in beautiful condition. And there's little notes by previous owner or owners. And uh, it was beautiful. And he had it rebound as well, um, which is something I use even today to study from. So thank you to Dr. Fleischer. But there's another young man um, who's called David Winselberg, and he and I have been studying every Shabbos, well, when I'm here in Shabbos, because I tend to be away speaking, um, for the last three years, the Alshech. And just a couple of nights ago, um, I had a bit of a cold, so I was feeling sorry for myself and wearing my pyjamas and dressing gown. He phoned up to say, how are you? I said, well, I'm actually in bed. He said, can I come round for a second? So I said, sure. So he turned up with his son, Yaakov, who's just from Minnesota, and he said, I just brought you something uh, to say how much I appreciated our study of the Alshech or Chavrusa, or learning every week. There was a, a parcel. I opened it, and out came this. And if we look inside, you can see, very ancient. There you can see. This is totally amazing. I'll read to you from the from the notes from the auction house where he bought it. Um, here it is. Here's our, our book again. And it says here, this is called um, the Ma'arat um, HaTzabot, Venice, that's the name of it. It's the, the Alshul's commentary on, on the prophets. It was published in Venice in 1603 by the Alshuk's son. Um, and this is the first edition. Not only that, it was, it was if you look here, at the beginning of it, it was owned, you see the signature, you can see the signature at the top, by somebody called Rabbi Chia Pontrimoli. And he wrote the, the Yalkut Meon Lois on Megillus Esther. And maybe he used this very edition. It's covered in pigskin, uh, which is very common for early, of course, Venice is one of the centers of early publishing. Venezia, and you'll see Venice in any early, any early books you'll find, like the Rambam, etc. So here, it was very common to, uh, to have it, uh, uh, the, the cover to be pigskin. That's no halakhic problems or even insult uh, in that. Um, and here it is. Again, 1603. Very clear, can be studied from. Some notes as well for me to enjoy. As an interesting uh, footnote, um, you can see here there's a tear. And very often they used padding other things. There's letters in here in Hebrew. I haven't had a chance to look at them. I'm playing with the idea of whether to have it rebound. I'm not sure. I'm going to ask a couple of friends of mine who are experts in this. But can you imagine this? I'm holding this, which was the first edition. A strong possibility that the son of the Alshach himself held in his hand. There couldn't have kind of been too many published. And owned by another great rabbi. Um, and here you are. So in celebration, I was telling this to my morning covrissa, and he said, you know, a lovely idea is to make a small three or four minute uh, every week, a uh, little, I think, I'll, I think I'll call it Gems of the Alshech, um, in which a little jewel of something the Alshech says on the weekly set or the weekly part of the part of the Torah that we read every single week, uh, to give you an insight into who, who he was and how great he was. Um, it's very, the Alshech's difficult. He's, uh, he will analyze with incredible depth the Hebrew of a verse in the Bible. Why does it say, why is it in the past tense when it should be in the present tense? Why is it in the plural instead of the, of, of the, of the singular? Um, why does it take 10 words to say 
uh, or to convey a message which could clearly be done in five words, because there's no word extra in the in the Torah, because God's good at Hebrew, and uh, if there are extra words or even an extra letter, then his uh, antennae, um, his interest is sparked, and he wants to know why. And the books behind me, and all the books, uh, the answers to those those questions are found. So he would sometimes can ask something like twenty or thirty questions just in one verse. Um, but of course, it's based on the Hebrew. So I thought, let's do that. So this week's seder, it's strange, I suppose, to start a whole process in the middle. It'd be nice to start in Genesis, but hopefully we'll do the whole the whole year, and you'll be able to access these and just get a, free, a quick vartar from the Alshech every week, a gem of the Alshech. This week's parsha is the parsha of Shmini. So I'm going to use the the art scroll, which most people have, which make it easily available, and let's just get into it. And then I'll tell you what the Alshech says, which I think you'll find enjoyable and important. So, at the beginning of the Sedra, let's read and translate. By he Biyama Shmini. And it was on the eighth day, Korah Moishal Aaron. On the eighth day, we're talking about, well, let's let's see what Rashi says here. I take off my glasses because my my dear friend and optician, David Goldberg in Manchester, says it's uh, it's a it's a sign of my receding youth. Biyama uh, Hashmini, Shmini Lemeluim. It was the eighth day of the consecration of the Mishkan, which was the prototype, the miniature temple, which would eventually become uh, permanent in Jerusalem. Oh, well, permanent, it lasted for 410 years, then 420 years, um, but semi-permanent. Uh, it was traveling along, along with the Jewish people. Shmini Melulim, who Rosh Chodesh Nisan, so on the, the first of the month of Nisan, which is of course the, the month in which Passover occurs. Who Rosh Chodesh Nisan? Shahukam HaMishkan, that's where they set up the Mishkan. Boy, Biyam, and not less and there was ten other great things that happened on that day, which are recounted, he says, in various uh, uh, Jewish classic sources. So that's what we're talking about. There is seven days of preparation, of consecration of the Mishkan. Uh, and then this part of the story, Rosh Chodesh, is the eighth day. And the problem is that it was only meant to be seven days. So why is there an eighth day? Everybody asks that question. Let's see. By he So it was on the eighth day, Korah Moshe, Moshe calls to Aaron, Olavonam, and to his sons, Olazit Nisrael, and to the elders of the Jewish people. By Yomer El Aaron, he says to Aaron, Kach l'chola ekel ben Boker, take for yourself a calf, a young calf, l'chatos, um, and it's to be a sin offering. So you offer a sin offering for something obviously you've done wrong. Va'ayel um, la and there's to be an ayel, a ram, to be an oila. An oil is, uh, I think, a burnt offering is what they call it uh, in Hebrew, Tamima. It's going to be perfect. Hakrib of Hashem, bring it before Hashem. So that's Aaron's. Two, he's got to offer two sacrifices. He's got to offer a, a calf and he's got to offer a ram. And then the next post, it says, El Ben Israel to the Jewish people, to Dabar Lemor, you will say, You've got to take, I'll read this quickly in, he, in the English here. And, to the Jew, and children of Israel speak as follows Take a he goat for a sin offering and a calf and a sheep. In the first year, unblemished for an elevation offering. Ah, so I said it was for a burnt offering, so they call it an, an ola as an elevation offering. And a bull and a ram for a peace offering to slaughter before Hashem, and a meal offering mixed with oil, for today Hashem appears to you. So not only had they set up the Mishkan, but then there was going to be a fire that would come from heaven, a miraculous fire which would eat up and uh, incinerate uh, the sacrifices that they were, they were being offered for some of them. Fine, that's the story. The al um, is intrigued uh, why it uh, says uh, Vayhi. Vayhi always indicates something bad's going to happen, and it was on the eighth day. So let's bear in mind it was only meant to be seven days, but the Alsha is talking, or the, the Torah is talking about the eighth day, which the Alsha is going to talk about and address. Moshe calls to Aaron and he calls to his sons, as Aaron's sons, they're going to be the priests, the Kohanim who serve in the, tem- in the Mishkan and the elders of the Jewish people. What's the point of calling to the elders of the Jewish people? Rashi says, so that they can see that the appointment of Aaron was done at the instruction of God, that it wasn't nepotism, it wasn't favoritism. Um, but the Alshach's going to say something different. So let's see what the Alshach has to say. This, incidentally, is the one that I usually use. This is a modern Alshach. This is his commentary on the Yikra. There are five volumes of this. Um, <clears throat> so the Alshach says the following, the following interesting thing. He says that if you want to criticize somebody, or criticize, I mean constructive criticism, if you want to uh, find, uh, remedy something wrong that somebody has done, 
there is an approach that you have to do. So the creation of the Mishkan was an acceptance of the, the apology, the moving forward of the Jewish people for the Egel Azov. The Egel Azov, the golden calf the Jewish people made, disaster. God forgives them through the intervention of Moses. And then the remedy for this is a Mishkan. So God who comes down, his presence is there with Moshe, Moshe the Ten Commandments. The Jewish people feel that. Then they make a mess of it. God retreats, as it were, from the Jewish people. The Mishkan now is going to come back again to the Jewish people. So the Mishkan is totally related to the sin of the golden calf. Ah. So if you, you've you ever understood the, the concept of Mida Kenegh and Mida, you will know that's what Dovod Melech says, to you Hashem is kindness, ki ata to shalom ishka because you pay a person back for his deeds, mida kineged mida. But the same thing that you've done wrong, the same thing you've done wrong to somebody, happens to you, and that says King David in the verse in, in the Psalms and to him that is a kindness, Hashem chesed, to you God is kindness, because you pay a person back for their deeds. In the same way, with the same coin, as it were, that they did the sin in the first place. The answer, to, the reason for that is quite is quite obvious. Very often we do things wrong, and we don't realise that we've done things wrong, or we've hurt other people. But if the same thing happens to us and it hurts us, we realise it's painful, and we therefore, sorry, can regret the fact that we've done something wrong to somebody else. So, Moshe Rabbeinu did something wrong. Do you remember back in that story, right at the beginning of Exodus, God appears to him in the burning bush and he says to him, I want you to go and save the Jewish people. And uh, Moshe says, well, not me, I'm not, I'm not erudite, I can't speak, I've got a voice impediment, a speech impediment, people are going to laugh at me, uh, Aaron's much better. Seven days, God, uh, Moshe kept, kept God, Moses kept God waiting before he eventually acquiesced and said he would do it. Therefore, for seven days, Moshe sets up dedicates the, 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 the Mishkan, the prototype temple, not the prototype, the miniature temple, um, and nothing happens. God keeps him waiting. That's not spite, that's not vengeance, not bearing a grudge. It's merely to indicate to him what he did wrong. So now Moshe has got to put that right. So that's why it says Vayi, something bad. It's, a rem it's remembering what he did that was bad, that was wrong, and keeping God waiting. God keeps him waiting, so he regrets that, and can, can put it right. Then, now that he's put it right and regretted and done, it's called Teshuva, sorted his problem out, at that point, then he can call to Aaron. So God, let's do it again, by Hebe Yamash, meaning they, they call Moshe. Moshe calls to Aaron and to his sons. They're going to take over the role. Actually, Aaron is going to get the, the miraculous phenomenon to occur in combination with Moshe later on. But why the Zikni is strong? So you remember at the burning bush, Moshe uh, eventually agrees, then Aaron comes to meet him. And together they go with the elders of the Jewish people and uh, to tell Pharaoh the message from God, let the Jewish people go. And of course, Pharaoh says no. But when they're going, Moshe and Aaron are going towards Pharaoh, the, the Jew, uh, when they get there, the verse says, Moshe and Aaron got, uh, arrived. But the elders, all these other leaders of the Jewish people had originally started to go with them. But as they got near the palace of Pharaoh, their courage deserted them and they deserted the, the gathering of Jews that were going to petition or demand their uh, release by, from Pharaoh. And so by the time they got there, it was only Moshe and Aaron. So they've got something to put right as well. But then there's also the Jewish people. After all, they made the golden calf. So the message here is, that first of all, Moshe has to sort himself out. The phrase in English is, people in glass houses can't throw stones. Then he speaks to Aaron and says to Aaron, now, you and your sons, um, you've got to offer a sacrifice. What sacrifice? Let's read the second verse. For Yama El Aaron, he says to Aaron, Kach l'chola egel ben boker. Take a, a calf. The calf you're offering as a sacrifice is to indicate that the thing you did wrong in your participation even for the right reasons, even to stall them till Moses could return and sort out the problem, was still something that ultimately there was a flaw in it. So this is putting it right. You are forgiven. You're bringing a sacrifice to be forgiven. And the type of sacrifice he brings is exactly, hints clearly at the thing that he did wrong. So again, it's a medic and egg and so that you will sort yourself out. 
But to the Jewish people, it's very intriguing here. For the Jewish people, they don't bring a sin offering. A chatos, incidentally, a chatos, a sin offering, is for something he did unintentionally. And Aaron is told to bring a chatos of a, a calf, of the golden calf. It wasn't an intentional sin. With regards to the Jewish people, then they don't bring a chatos for that. It's very interesting. Why? Well, B'nai Israel, let's leave that verse. The Jewish people, to Dabar, they more say, you've got to bring a seer izim, goat, to be a chatos. The eagle, the kes of B'nai Shana, to me, Malayla. So this elevated offering, it says in the art scroll, that's got to be the, that's when you're going to bring the eagle. The shore of an isle, and you're going to bring an ox, and an isle, the shlamim, the zebach, the shem, min chabal, the shem, and give you shem, your alechem. So this is incredibly interesting. They bring the chatos, uh, the, uh, the chatos, therefore, they bring is to, sorry, so the, 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 their the sacrifice is just a seer izim. But the eagle, their calf, is to be an oila. An oila. What do you bring an oila for? An oila is for not something you've done wrong, intentionally, or something you've done wrong unintentionally. An oila is something you, you thought about doing. So here, let me read a little bit about the Alshu, from the Alshu for you. So listen, this is what he says. The Achbanei Israel, the Jewish people, Asher Chotok Mas Bemaise, who did things wrong, what happened? Oid Enim Lo Sofatoma. Asher Be'edim Israel, those who were warned by two kosher witnesses not to make the golden calf and went ahead, Horeg B'nei Levi, that's the Levites, there's only a couple of thousand, they were killed directly by a Levite. And Moses says, go and execute the people who did it. But to, to suffer capital punishment in Judaism, you require, before you did the act, two kosher witnesses to warn you, to stop you. And if you don't, then you deserve the ultimate punishment. So it was a couple of thousand who were killed in that way. Three thousand. Ba'asher be'edim v'lo'asro. And those who were witnessed getting involved in the golden calf, but they weren't warned, then that breaches the Torah's requirement before you can give somebody capital punishment. So even though people saw them doing it, but they weren't warned not to do it, then you can't give them capital punishment. Moses gave them something to drink. It was something to drink, the same story when a woman is accused of adultery, then um, you, you write Hashem's name on a piece of parchment, you put it in water, you give it to them, and if they're guilty, they die. Moses gave, and those who therefore were participants, but weren't warned, they died through Moses' miraculous, as it were, intervention. But those who didn't have the adim, nor did they have warning, then there was a, if you remember, there was a plague that broke out. That was God, because he can, he doesn't need the, the, the human process. Um, so that, they died that way. But for those who stood back and let it happen, who didn't intervene, who facilitated it by their silence, what's the phrase? All, you, all it needs for evil to prosper is for good men to say nothing. Then they only thought about it. Their, their problem was, as it were, in their mind. Uh, or in their thoughts, then for that, you bring an oila. An oila is for a thing you, you thought about doing wrong or you had a bad thought. So that's that. Now, what's the message? The message is people in gla gra glass houses can't throw stones. First of all, Moses has to sort out his own problem because he can't come and criticize somebody if they can point to you and say, well, you're just as bad. So Moses has got a flaw in with regards to the making of the Mishkan and that is going to be um, well, from the previous thing, when he kept God waiting, God keeps him waiting, then he can sort that out. That's the vayhi, it's a reminder of something wrong. But the vayhi reminds them all of all of something wrong. The zakanim are there, even though it's Moses telling Aaron and his children to become the priests, but the zakanim, they have to also realise at this moment what they did wrong. And that was, of course, they, they dropped out from the, the group of people, from the delegation that were going to petition Pharaoh to let the Jewish people go. And then you might have thought, with regards to Aaron, let the Jewish people actually did it. Let them bring their sacrifice first, and then I'll bring mine. No, no, no. Because Aaron, you, for them to see you as their leader, or one of their great leaders, then they can't have any secret uh, skepticism or cynicism with regards to your role. So before you speak to them, you bring your sacrifice, which addresses your participation, even though it was for good reasons, and, that, and then God will say, right, you're forgiven for that. So now that they know that you've been forgiven, now that Moses has been forgiven, he's done teshuva, and now Aaron has been forgiven, he's done teshuva with his katos, then we can address the Jewish people and ask of them that they should sort out their flaw or their historical guilt 
in the making of the golden calf, encourage them to bring a sacrifice. Not, and it's a sacrifice that addresses what they did wrong at the golden calf. That was a only in their minds, not in their actions. Now here is a very simple idea. I think there's a there's a, an idea for all of us, and the idea is that you got to put your own house in order before you criticise somebody else. There was a famous English uh, philosopher called Bertram Russell, and if, I think. I can't remember it was either Oxford or Cambridge. He taught moral philosophy, but he was a moral bankrupt. He was a moral derelict, and he was quite famous as somebody like that. And one of his students, in the middle of one of his lectures, when he was lecturing on some lofty moral and ethical idea, had the courage um, to expose the hypocrisy and stuck up his hand and said, um, but professor, you don't practice what you preach, to which Bertram Russell looked at him and said, and to teach mathematics, does one have to be a triangle? Well, to teach mathematics, of course, you don't have to be a triangle, but we believe you have to believe in triangles. You have to believe the triangles are valid, or a valid mathematical construct, or geometric construct. Um, and if you are not able to say, I at least aspire to the idea that I'm teaching, uh, then the teaching is not, is not going to be listened to. The Talmud says, words from the heart enter the heart. Devorim ayatsim in alev, nikmosim in so here, <coughs> we see this structure in this week's Sadra. Moshe deals with his problem. Does to shoot him. Is forgiven. Then he tells Aaron, you do it as well. The specific one in your case, which is your participation in the Golden Calf. Then, now you can talk to them. And once the Jewish people have sorted themselves out, then on the eighth day, they can be, as it were, worthy of Hashem descending and appearing in front of them in this brand new structure called the Mishkan, which solved the problem of the mistake of the golden calf. So this has gone on, I see, in my for near 21 minutes. Uh, it will be shorter in weeks to come, but hopefully we'll learn an al every week, and uh, we'll have a, the, a gem every week, and at the end we'll have a, a treasure trove of uh, jewels from the al Kodesh on the Parshas, an entire year's. I wish you all a very good Shabbos. Shabbat Shalom.